Good afternoon, everybody. I do hope you can hear me. Andrew, can you confirm you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly as well. Great. Uh, welcome all the WebConf attendees for this first uh, sponsor talk. We are very glad to uh, welcome Andrew Zai, who got his uh, Bachelor of, uh, from uh, UC Berkeley and his uh, Master of Science from Stanford University before being one of the founding engineers of Pinterest Lab, where he has led the visual search team, working notably on computer vision algorithm for the so-called Pinterest lens. And Andrew is now a senior staff applied scientist and a tech lead for machine learning in the core engineering team at Pinterest. And this team works on recommendation and search algorithm, as well as on content and user understanding, including computer vision, as Pinterest is a visual first social media. We are very glad to have Andrew today, who will present us the core inspiration engine of Pinterest, which is powered by artificial intelligence. And this talk will also brush out some emerging technologies such as augmented reality and generative AI. So please welcome Andrew for this exciting and inspiring talk. Andrew, floor is yours. Awesome, thank you for the introduction, Raphael. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Did that work? Can you uh, see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Awesome. Uh, great. So today I'll be talking about how we power the Pinterest inspiration product uh, through machine learning, uh, the problem statements, approaches, uh, and learnings, as well as the challenges uh, that we're, we're facing. So there's a lot of content. Uh, let's just get started. So Pinterest is the home of inspiration. People come to Pinterest to find ideas, such as what recipe should I cook for breakfast uh, this morning, or looking for that aesthetic design for your next home remodel. Our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. Oops, one sec. The way we do this is through our content. It all starts with a pin saved by a user consisting of an image or video, as well as other components uh, like the title and description to provide more detail. What's really special about Pinterest uh, is that users save these pins into collections called boards. Uh, here you see my boards where uh, all the recipes I know of in this world uh, are stored in the Pinterest board that I've gathered over the last seven years, where every time I cook something significant, I have to open up my Pinterest app, go to my board, uh, and you can see here that I only know how to cook 27 recipes because I only have 27 pins in my recipe board. Uh, very recently, I've also been researching how to build a camper van for traveling. And I've been using Pinterest as the way to store and organize all that information. Uh, what type of van should I buy? What type of insulation should I buy? Stuff like that. What's really powerful about boards are that they represent this very nuanced taste and understanding from our users. Here's an example, given this kitchen, uh, kitchen pin, one user saves the content into their board for blue accent designs. Here, they care about the, the, uh, the blue accents uh, of the furniture and you can see in their boards, they have other blue furniture as well. Uh, that's their taste, that's what they like. Another user saves this exact same content into a board for uh, vintage kitchen designs. Here, they don't care about individual components, they care about the overall aesthetic feel, the, the vintage style, and they have other pins, other kitchen pins in their boards that uh, have the same style. And another user focuses on the fireplace in this pin and saves it to uh, their fireplace collection. Each user has a different viewpoint on what this content represents. And what's really powerful about this is that we have these relationships at scale. That's what really makes Pinterest special. Uh, we have over 330 billion pins, 7 billion boards curated by over uh, 400 million users. Essentially, Pinterest is a unique curated data set at massive scale of how people describe and organize things. The inspiration engine refers to a collection of products that we built where ultimately we connect users with ideas, with pins. Uh, whether it's from receiving content, as soon as you open our application through home feed, our personalized recommendation system, 
uh, to exploring content more actively by typing in a search query uh, via image search to find whatever you uh, want to search for. What's really important uh, at Pinterest is that we optimize for inspirational engagement in these systems. Uh, where here you see that by optimizing for saves, we naturally promote uh, these how-to content, uh, DIY content that users can take action, are, uh, action on and are actually useful. Alternatively, when you optimize for view time, you get these really clickbaity uh, lifestyle content. And that's not uh, what we want to optimize for. We care about inspiration. We care about uh, powering saves. I'll walk you through the architecture and how we build these recommendation products, starting with the front end and the user requests recommendation. So this system diagram uh, describes home feed, the personalized recommendation system in, in more detail. The first step we need to do is fetch uh, more signals. Uh, we, we have a lot of signals around about the user as, as well as the content, also the context of uh, the current time and also uh, history of what a user has interacted with Pinterest at that point in time. These are all computed offline and we fetch them on the fly uh, for scalability. One thing important to note here is that uh, this recommendation system needs to support uh, tens of thousands of concurrent requests and be able to retrieve from billions of pins. So we try to push as much compute offline as we can. Embeddings of users uh, and content, as well as knowledge graphs, taxonomy predictions for users and pins are commonly used types of signals uh, throughout our stack. We then go to candidate generation where we need to filter through billions of content really fast, often less than 100 milliseconds into thousands of relevant uh, content to the current user. And we have many methods to do this, whether it's embedding-based retrieval, whether it's graph traversal of the pinboard graph, and we use an ensemble of these approaches to generate the best candidates. Next, after candidate generation, we have thousands of results, and we need to refine them uh, with more information to come up with the final list that we show our users. Decomposing this step, given thousands of pins, we run this multitask neural network on each user pin pair. The model leverages hundreds of features across embeddings, across ID features, categorical features, continuous features, and more. Uh, and overall, the idea is to predict probabilities of individual engagement, such as uh, the probability of saves, the probability of clicks, and the probability of hides. From these raw predicted probabilities, we then combine them together in our multi-objective optimization function to get the final score used to rank candidates. Uh, this is where we balance relevance versus diversity. Uh, this is also where we balance pinner satisfaction with creator and advertiser satisfaction. When we're building a creator economy, for example, we need to guarantee a minimum number of views per content to incentivize users to create more content, right? So when I create a content on Pinterest, if I get zero views, I'm not, I'm not gonna create more content on Pinterest. There's just no incentive to do so. So in general, this part is quite complicated. We have a lot of different tenets and the functional form of this final utility uh, score contains many non-linearities, uh, which makes this weight tuning a challenge in practice. Uh, it's very, uh, here, if the, in the ideal form, we want to reach the parental optimal frontier where we reach a point where the only way to make the system better is through a trade-off in these utilities. But unfortunately, the non-linearities non make uh, this challenge. Hopefully that gives you a sense of the entire funnel. It's pretty complicated, uh, but to scale to billions of content with tens of thousands of concurrent, concurrent requests, while also producing these good results, balancing these multiple objectives across users, creators, retailers, advertisers, and also Pinterest, uh, it's necessary to have a lot of these complexities. Next, I'll start deep diving into areas across the funnel, starting with content understanding. So Pinterest is predominantly a visual platform. Unfortunately, pixels are not easily ingestible by downstream ML systems. Uh, one way to make pixels into something more useful is to encode the raw pixels into embeddings, where we can learn similar similarity functions so that two images that are related are close together in the embedding space. If we do this well, 
we can see that when we project these embeddings down to a 2D manifold, uh, you can achieve some sort of visual clustering. So here you see that uh, on the top left, we have uh, quotes and quotes are clustered together. On the top right, we have uh, food, food items, and those are clustered together as well. Um, and also, sorry, I didn't realize, so before I started the presentation, the video couldn't be started. I didn't realize it could be started now. So I'll start the video now. Um, so in general, we can have the, we can learn these embeddings so that distances are meaningful. Now, over the years, we've invested in many of these visual signals and products, starting in 2014, where we optimized these visual embeddings to power visual search over billions of images. Over time, you can imagine we've tackled more and more problems. Recently, we shipped a feature in our product relying on visual classification of hair texture to promote an inclusive product. We also have classifiers predicting parts of our knowledge graph, such as the color and fabric of this dress. And in general, we have over 20 use cases and count. Notably though, the number of researchers and engineers have not scaled nearly as fast as the number of problems to solve. So we run into this problem uh, in practice. How can we continue improving the performance uh, when the number of models are scaling much faster than the number of employees? We couldn't maintain the volume of use cases and our model performance suffered as a result just because we didn't have time to go back and improve uh, the system. For example, the latest uh, models at that time uh, were using encoders like Squeeze and Excitation ResNext 101, uh, the latest and greatest at that point in time. While our visual search embeddings trained back in 2014, we're still on VGG-16, an encoding uh, that was outdated at that point. Hence, we introduced our Pinterest Unified Visual Backbone, one model for all visual understanding at Pinterest. Today, our backbone produces 20 plus uh, use cases, including embeddings, classifiers, regressions, all the tasks that I was describing before. So beyond the maintenance benefit, we saw that multitask actually produced the best results. Uh, this is not always the case. Uh, in our case, however, we, we saw that part of the reason why this was happening is that we were breaking through these human separation of data sets, where previously we have one data set, one model. Now we have all data sets fed into one model. And running the ablation uh, on, the, on the right, we saw that uh, Using the same exact model setup, training on individual data sets versus all the data sets together, uh, training on all the data sets together led to the best performance. Our neural network was able to find the best data set sharing configuration. One model makes iterations so much easier and enables us to invest in a strong foundation. We attempted to pre train our visual model on 1.3 billion images while leveraging the, the hottest encoder at that time, which was a funnel hybrid VIT model that essentially combines convolutions for the lower levels uh, of the encoder uh, with transformers at the higher levels. Uh, from the pre-trained model, then we then fine-tuned it on the 20 plus use cases. In general, this lifted majority of the 20 plus use cases that we had and enabled visual understanding at Pinterest to adopt the latest technology very quickly. Uh, we see in the figure on the right, uh, the change in offline metric for a, a variety of use cases. And most, so here we have uh, nine different use cases. Uh, we're plotting the difference of the offline eval after the pre-training uh, versus before. And you can see that for majority of the use cases, it was a very positive change. Uh, building skill pre-training allowed us to lift majority of the visual understanding use cases at Pinterest. Now we have a strong visual representation, but this is only one piece of the puzzle. A pin is much more complex. How can we represent all dimensions of our content? Again, a pin has many components, the most prevalent of which is the image or video, but we also have the title and description, the user that created the content, as well as the board the pin is saved to. We learned earlier that the pin board graph is this massive scale data set of how people describe and organize things. Uh, how can we leverage this to build the best content representation? PinSage is our solution to this, a graph neural network allowing us to combine the visual and text information with the pin board graph. Uh, we reduced the full graph down, the 330 billion pins, the 7 billion boards, 
uh, down into the most informative 3 billion nodes and 18 billion edges for this work. So here, given the, the graph, given the raw node features, we're able to encode them with their GNN to produce the, the pin embedding. Uh, so again, given a pin, we sample from the pin board graph using some graph sampling method, whether it's uh, K-Hop neighborhood sampling or uh, random walks. And then we fetch the node features, the, the self features, as well as the neighbor features, uh, which here are the visual and text embeddings. Uh, we, we then encode these through a graph neural network to produce the node embedding uh, that's trained so that similar pins that are related have similar embeddings. Uh, unlike traditional work where we train over the graph in a self-supervised manner, we actually leverage engagement data from our recommendation systems for the supervision of uh, PinSage. The overall idea is that we have a lot of query pins uh, to positive pin relationships. We have a product where uh, a user sees a query pin uh, as well as the recommendations for uh, that are contextual to that pin um, and say that a user saves the piece of content uh, from that surface. We know that this query pin and this positive pin uh, are similar to each other uh, based on user uh, engagement. Negatives are harder to get. In general, what we found is that using a combination of in-batch negative sampling as well as random sampling uh, performed the best, enabling us to form these query pin positive pin, negative pin triplets to learn the embedding. Our infrastructure and algorithm for PinSage has evolved over time, uh, starting with an approach more akin to the traditional GraphSage method with KHOP neighborhood sampling uh, and other details uh, for GraphSage. What was incredibly challenging in our case was really the scale of the graph. Uh, and to solve this problem, we actually built custom uh, research hardware. So these are not meant for production, these were, you can think of it as a, a, a piece of hardware that uh, we sort of just manually crafted ourselves that had uh, these like beefy 1.5 terabyte RAM uh, uh, memory, uh, as well as uh, eight GPUs to have enough compute to train the model. Uh, for inference, uh, we had, because of reliability issues, we couldn't use these uh, sort of janky research machines for this. So we found a way to split the forward pass of the architecture uh, into separate Hadoop jobs uh, for inference, where here you see that we actually uh, reproduced the forward pass of the model as individual Hadoop jobs uh, with some caching tricks to actually enable the, the scaling. Uh, the pro here is that it works. Uh, it's able to scale to the graph that we need and the content embedding produced was very performant. The con was that the special hardware requirement where we only have like two of these uh, physical machines ultimately slowed down in innovation uh, because it restri uh, restricted our developer velocity um, as well as sort of limiting sort of the, the paths that we can take from an algorithmic perspective. Uh, some more details there are that uh, we were running into the upper limits of the 1.5 terabyte RAM uh, that enabled, that prevented us from scaling to more data and in general made it challenging to, to iterate. Productionization was also a challenge because we had completely separate train and serve stacks. We aimed to solve this in V2. The main insight was that on the fly graph sampling was the main reason for the RAM requirements. Because when we have on the fly graph sampling, we not only need to store the raw graph, but we also need to have a, a key value store that we can look up on the fly. Uh, and the key value store in general is why we need so much memory. To simplify uh, the setup uh, of multi-hop neighborhood sampling, we saw that random walks where a given node produces 50 neighbors uh, based on random walks was better performing. Uh, this simplified things because instead of a multi-hop data structure, uh, now the data structure is more flat, given the sort of more suitable for like a key value lookup where given the current node, we were able to return the 50 neighbors uh, that were produced from random walks. This allowed us then to move the graph sampling offline as a cron job. We had a highly efficient uh, random walk service that we use for candidate generation called Pixie. Uh, and this enabled us to scrape Pixie uh, every few days for training, generating the 3 billion uh, neighbors as needed. The data set preparation then would fully materialize the self and neighbor features instead of previously where we had to uh, join the neighbors sample with the key value store on the fly. We pushed this into the data prep uh, that 
and fully materialize both the self and neighbor features uh, in ETO. Train and inference then are unified, where both can rely on streaming these fully materialized data sets for either learning or for inference. So the benefit was now you can leverage commodity hardware. There's no more RAM requirements because the expensive part of the key value lookup is now pushed into uh, Hadoop. We can iterate faster on data sets while the architectures, loss functions, and more. But the one trade-off was that now it's challenging to iterate on the graph sampling itself. Uh, the other benefit was that moving to random walks and using the visit counts for importance pooling uh, had a pretty substantial increase in our offline metrics, around the 46% increase in our offline metrics. With this flexibility, we arrived at V3. Similar to the visual backbone, we also have many use cases for pin embeddings. And we arrived at a multitask learning setup uh, where now we have 16 different objectives, optimizing uh, different content formats. For example, we have videos, we have ads, we have products. Each one of these have a slightly nuanced metadata available. Uh, and we wanted to aim for one comprehensive content embedding for all because in the end, Pinterest is just one product and users most likely uh, don't differentiate between the different content formats. We also made other tweaks to the algorithm, such as moving the triplet loss to sampled softmax, but perhaps the noteworthy change to describe here is that we leverage a transformer now to early fuse the self and neighbor features. So previously, the, two, uh, the, the architecture was more separate where self features, uh, neighbor features were aggregated first and then combined with the self features, but now we sort of let the model figure out how to uh, best encode both the self and neighbor features. In general, on the bottom left, you see a, a sort of this comparison between PinSage V3 and V2. And you're able to see that compared uh, on our offline evals, V3 was able to be substantially better for the majority of our use cases. In general, PinSage has been very successful across Pinterest with over 70 plus launches across candidate generation, trust and safety classifiers, taxonomy prediction via classifier head on top of the embedding, and much more. On the left, we plot the offline eval over time against many content embedding methods that we have of interest. And we see that overall, PinSage gives the best performance compared to raw text, compared to visual, compared to uh, using random blocks to generate uh, embeddings. Let's move on to user modeling next. The foundation to personalization across Pinterest. The aim is to understand a user's taste and preferences and encode that knowledge in a manner usable by ML systems. One trend that you'll see is that a strong content embedding, PinSage, uh, is the foundation to these more complex representation learning uh, methods. One approach to learn user embeddings is through this unsupervised clustering uh, method that we call PinnerSage. We published this method in KDD 2020, where the overall idea is that users constantly interact uh, with our product. For a given user, we have a pool of their uh, recent interactions. Uh, this can be computed in real time. Uh, users interact with pins, so we have the PinSage embeddings for all their activities, and we're able to use a uh, unsupervised uh, clustering method to separate this like pool of engagement into these interest clusters. When we have these interest clusters, then what we can do is take the medioid of these clusters to produce uh, embeddings where overall, given the user, we now have multiple uh, embeddings for that user uh, that are uh, interpretable. Each cluster represents uh, the pin stage embedding of the medioid pin of that cluster. We can even look up the exact pin ID that represents of that cluster. It seems like a simple idea, but in general, this was actually really effective, uh, where we had over 10 plus launches, some of them lifting uh, home feed, our personalized recommendation system that powers the majority of engagement on interest by around like 3% increase in uh, save volume. It's really nice to have this interpretability where you can see, given the user, what are the interest clusters? Uh, where are the, the pins used to represent that user? Uh, but of course, the, the con is that there's no parameter sharing. It's not, this is not a learned approach. Uh, there's no way to share parameters from, say, a user that has already, uh, or that's much more engaged on the platform. There's no way to smear their activity 
uh, as a strong prior for a new user that's seemingly taking the same path uh, as that user. Um, what's also challenging with this approach is that there's no explicit learning objective. There's no easy way to tune the model to uh, exhibit a behavior that you want um, because there's no way to formulate a loss function that you can optimize end to end. Hence, we introduce a uh, pinner former, a learned user embedding. The idea here is that given the past year of user activity, where some users have hundreds of activities and others have perhaps thousands of activities, uh, we form training examples by randomly splitting this one year timeline uh, during training, where we take the last 255 actions from the split uh, as our input to a user embedding encoder. This produces one user embedding that we then use to predict actions in the future. We represent these activities via PinSage and structure the learning objective as a retrieval method. Uh, and this is because we have billions of pins, so it's not possible to learn a uh, vocabulary lookup. One detail I'll go into uh, for Pinner Former that is quite interesting is really the, the loss formulation. What does it mean to, uh, how do we structure the learning for this user embedding? And in general, we evaluated many methods for structuring our learning objective and introduced this dense all action loss, a method to jointly optimize for both short-term and long-term interest. Uh, to understand dense all action loss, let's take a look at the all action loss first. Specifically given the final user embedding, we can predict all positive actions in the next 28 days, where essentially we uh, have a retrieval loss per action and then average out uh, each action contribution per user. We then move to the dense all action loss formulation where we essentially, uh, instead of having one final user embedding, uh, we take the intermediate user embeddings from say like a transformer encoder as well. And for each output, we run uh, the all action loss. So we densely compute the all action loss for each uh, intermediate user embedding. The idea here is that given 255 inputs to the transformer, you produce 255 outputs. We add a causal masking to the transformer to prevent, uh, the, to prevent the embedding from, to prevent each intermediate step of the embedding to look into the future. Uh, and then essentially this gives us 255 user embeddings uh, during the forward pass that we can apply this dense all action loss to. Uh, intuition essentially is that this is a denser way to supervise the learning of the user, uh, user embedding, the transformer encoder for the user embedding. Uh, on the right, you see based on our offline eval, uh, leveraging the dense all action loss over 28 days uh, led to the, uh, the best performance. And we actually see that increasing 28 days to even uh, longer periods of time leads to better and better performance. Pinner former with one embedding outperformed the best result possible with 20 Pinner Sage clusters. We launched this embedding across 10 plus use cases at Pinterest and had the largest impact of the year uh, with site-wide impacts of three to four percent save volume increase and around like a 1.8 percent revenue increase. We've discussed many uh, representation learning projects. But let's take a closer look at the recommendation system itself with the focus on ranking. To remind ourselves, ranking produces uh, probability predictions of individual actions for each candidate pin in the funnel. The ranking model is uh, leverages as many features as we can possibly find about users, context, uh, and pins, as long as they're useful. Uh, because we want to make these predictions as performant as possible. This is very close to as downstream uh, of a model as we can uh, in these recommendation systems. Uh, oftentimes, because of the sheer amount of features, the hundreds of features, uh, these models are served on the CPU, not the GPU, because the GPU kernel launch itself for hundreds of small ops uh, actually is very slow. At Pinterest, our ranking system serves over 10 million inferences per second at a P99 latency of roughly 10 milliseconds. So the model needs to be really performant from an infrastructure perspective. The first few years of ranking progressed from malicious regression to trees to neural networks, 
uh, where the first neural network was having an individual neural network per action type. We then finally moved to this multi-task neural network setup. Each step along the way, we were able to measure uh, via A-B experiments an incremental gain in the save volumes uh, lifted. PinSage Pinner former led the next wave of improvement, giving our ranking models access to strong representations of content and users that were produced from a much more complex offline model. Here again, we need to eat up this complexity offline so that online serving can be efficient and scalable. So the question then is what is next? And two trends of improvement that we've seen is one, increasing the parameter counts of the model and two, increasing, uh, as well as increasing the model complexity through using something like a transformer. Here's an example where, in general, uh, we have to remember that we feed these ranking models billions of examples that we can generate uh, nearly for free uh, based on user feedback. So it's very hard to overfit these models. As such, we've seen that as we increase parameter counts through either widening the fully connected layers or increasing the complexity through leveraging a transformer uh, to summarize, uh, to sort of mix these hundreds of features, we're able to get sizable offline uh, save volumes uh, through each of these steps. Of course, you see the challenge is the latency increase. There's a 10% latency increase from uh, widening the FC layer, but a 300% latency increase from introducing the transformer. The next trend that um, we've seen um, is end-to-end -end learning of raw features. The general idea is that uh, with deep learning models, we want to reduce the amount of feature engineering as possible to enable the model to learn interactions from as raw features as we can afford. Uh, here's an experiment where uh, we include the real-time user activity directly into the model. And this complements Pinterformer, which uses the same data source. The overall idea is that Pinterformer leverages engagement history for the last year, while this real-time uh, activity sequence focuses on the last week. The benefit of this real-time activity sequence as well is that you can early fuse the pin candidate with each element of the activity sequence, uh, as ranking has access to both the user and pin candidate features. Uh, compared to Pinterformer, where in Pinterformer we have to compress all the raw user activities into one final embedding, uh, giving, not giving access to the ranking model to fully learn end to end. We see that adding this real-time user sequence enables another step function increase uh, in safe performance with additional latency challenges, and et cetera. Overall, the challenge is scale. Latency and throughput I mentioned before, but for a reference, a 10% increase in latency leads to around 400K per year cost increase. It's very expensive. But thankfully, one promising area is actually moving parts of the model to GPU serving. Uh, we're here, starting from the transformer baseline, we see a 300 increase in latency for the CPU model. Naively moving everything to the GPU uh, causes latency to increase. But as we selectively move parts of the architecture uh, back to the CPU, we're able to uh, increase perform, uh, increase, decrease the latency gap. And the intuition here is that we uh, GPUs are suited for uh, small amounts of, of ops that are very compute heavy. And uh, the ranking model, sort of like the, the lower layers of the ranking model are not suited for GPU, but the higher level layers like the transformer are very much suited for the GPU. Hence, GPU serving unblocks, unlocks this next step of performance gain. Moving, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker just to make sure I have enough time. But in general, hopefully that gave you a good sense of the funnel of the recommendation system. And now I want to talk about the challenges that we're, we're facing in both recommendations as well as ML in general at Pinterest. In general, uh, models in industry like Pinterest are very dynamic. Uh, here, what we see is that we have the same model trained on different dates of training data. Uh, the line starts as soon as the model is deployed after training. What we can see here is that a model snapshot degrades over time uh, from problems such as concept drift. And retraining the model on new data recovers performance, where we can see that the start of each line recovers the performance degradation 
uh, from the previous model that was trained earlier on. Uh, again, these are exa exact same model training setups. The only difference is the data that we use to train the model. Uh, so in general, in industry, evaluations need to be at least two-dimensional and needs to include model performance uh, over time. If I had just told you that, it would be a solved problem, right? We can just retrain the model, that's all good and all. But what makes this really challenging is that uh, while models degrade over time, we also have these long chains of model dependencies, right? So visual embeddings are used by PinSage, but also 10 other uh, use cases where each of them are its own neural network models. Uh, PinSage is used by Pinterformer, but also hundreds of other use cases. Now, how can we decide how to retrain this whole stack? In software engineering, we have this concept of an application binary interface where a shared library can be recompiled without uh, being compatible uh, with being, while being compatible with downstream libraries. Uh, so there's like an interface guarantee, uh, but we lack the equivalent concepts for ML models. And this is a massive challenge uh, for velocity and performance in industry. For recommendation systems, I'm sure we're all familiar with the curse of the power law distributions uh, on both sides. So these are this is real data from the pinch recommendation system. And we see that for both users and content, uh, the, for save interactions, uh, this follows a power law distribution. Uh, we don't have much data for majority of users. We don't have much data for majority of content as well. Um, there are many methods that try to address this problem, uh, whether it's data sampling, where you can import and sample detail, whether it's explore and exploit to guarantee impression budget for fresh content, uh, whether it's self-supervision to enable few shot learning. Uh, but in general, this is one of the problems that plagues uh, the, the recommendation systems uh, in general. Human labeled data is, is another method to address this power law distribution. Uh, traditionally, search systems have benefited from such data, right? Because search queries to pins are very interpretable and uh, can be human judged. In general, though, in industry, data set is actually the most important area of focus, where we see that uh, when backtesting over sort of the improvements that we made relevance wise to a visual discovery product at Pinterest, we see that data set iterations accounted for a majority of the benefit. And this topic has become important enough where uh, we, there's new buzzwords spinning up around like software 2.0, where we want to program a neural network model through iterations of the data set, as well as this concept of a data centric ML uh, paradigm, where again, we want to focus on the data set. The main question is how do we build systems that enables iterations of the data set faster? Uh, active learning is, a, is an active area of focus for uh, this, this topic. Now, also, if you listen to my description of what ranking order utility does, you might have wondered if we're targeting the right objectives. Uh, this is a continuous investment of ours where we, in general, care. Uh, what we care the most about is satisfying the user problem, where we want to help users accomplish their journey. Usually what that means is completing some project that they have planned. If Pinterest does really well on this, users are incentivized to come back because Pinterest is useful. Compare this to what we do today. Today, we predict these intermediate, uh, immediate actions and then blend them together as a proxy for long-term satisfaction. And the challenge here is how do we directly optimize for pinner satisfaction, these long-term metrics? Is it causal inference to find what short-term action leads to long-term satisfaction? This is what we've tried uh, and is sort of a short-term method to, to get some uh, causality through the system. But ultimately, is a formulation like off-policy reinforcement learning the right way to go. What makes this really challenging is that we operate in this multi-tenant marketplace with, with very different rewards for users, creators, merchants, and, uh, and these multiple tenants in the multi-objective optimization. Lastly, the hardest challenge is really building a product that people find useful. Over the last few years, we've built this portfolio of AR products uh, as the first step to help users take action through enabling them to visualize their inspiration in their own homes for furniture, as well as their own face for makeup. Uh, but in the last year or so, what personally is really exciting to me is that I started out as a vision guy and it's been quite amazing seeing what generative AI has been able to produce. The level of fidelity in image synthesis uh, is now quite photorealistic, enabling these massive opportunities to, to, uh, for inspiration through visualization. We probably have all heard of DALI 2 recently from OpenAI and have seen these mind-blowing results uh, shared by researchers on Twitter. 
I wish I had infinite time to describe what else is going on. Uh, there's works such as like content ingestion where the key we're, we've been exploring graph neural networks to see if we can scale up automatic attribute mining from websites uh, to pins so that we can automatically create, for example, recipe pins by taking the, the recipe steps, the how-to steps from the uh, individual, the underlying uh, websites automatically. Uh, we also work on causal ML, causal inference. Uh, for example, notification uplift modeling to, to learn what's the optimal intervention policy for our notifications to bring users back onto our platform. I'll end with some takeaways. Pinterest is a unique curated data set of how people describe and organize things. ML is leveraged throughout our inspiration funnel to enable our mission of bringing everyone the inspiration to create a life they love at scale. Uh, deep learning methods are leading the way for performance. Scalability is baked deeply into our systems and ML algorithms. We need to operate at pretty massive scales and it, this heavily influences uh, the algorithms that we, we take uh, and approach. And most importantly, we have a lot of challenging technical problems to solve. Pinterest and the inspiration is not even close to a solved problem. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrew. It was a really, really an inspiring talk. So thanks a lot. I think we can all do a virtual uh, applause for Andrew. Um, and uh, we have a bit of time for a, a few questions. So feel free, the participants, to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and I will relay them to, uh, to Andrew. So we got a first question when you were talking about um, the user understanding part. And uh, the question you had is, um, what is the type of the softmax loss functions that you use, whether it was a simple or a full softmax that you were using at the time? Yeah, it's a good question. So here we're using sample softmax with probability correction uh, for the, the triple loss. Okay. Um, I do have myself another question. Um, you talk a lot about visual embeddings, of course, because Pinterest is visual first content. I'm yeah. wondering whether you also leverage text, textual data, um, being the captions or whatever the users are, the way they are tagging their, their pins and whether you use language models, for example, in your recommendation yes. engines. Yeah, for sure. We actually use language models extensively uh, for Pinterest as well. Uh, I wish I had more time to go into uh, how we learned these text embeddings, but uh, sort of similar flavor where they're also multitask, um, train on both search sessions, uh, as well as the raw descriptions and titles that we have in a uh, self-supervised manner. Okay. And uh, one more question. Um, you, you said that among the challenges, there is the, the fact that the machine learning models are very dynamic and that you can observe some concept drifts. And I was wondering if you had some examples of, of um, pin concepts where from which you see the meaning of evolve and even change over the time. Did, could you come up with some examples out of your mind? Yeah, yeah. Um... So I think in general, concept drift happens uh, much more aggressively uh, during like, holidays. So specifically like during Valentine's Day, uh, when the training window includes Valentine's Day events, you see a lot of people on Pinterest, uh, they share like Valentine's gifts for uh, him or her, uh, these types of concepts. But as soon as Valentine's Time's Day is over, uh, you sort of want your recommendation system to be able to, to understand that uh, Valentine's Day is over. Uh, unfortunately, because everything is uh, smeared, uh, this doesn't happen in practice. And that's an example where concept, concept drifts uh, matters. Um, I think also this is a pretty well studied problem. There's uh, some papers from Alibaba that demonstrates the same effect where uh, given their like big sale day, training on that data actually hurts performance uh, in the future. And they actually explicitly uh, blacklist these uh, special events to prevent their models from uh, being overly specific to uh, for them, the sales, but for us, like Valentine's Day, Easter, stuff like that. Okay, thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, it was wonderful to um, to welcome you. Oh, one one last question. Um, uh, oh yeah, I was just a, um, an attendee was wondering whether you could make your slides available. Um, uh, maybe you can publish them or share 
the link to your Google Slides on your Twitter account and we will relay them? Yeah, you there's no problem. It? I can also send you the PDF of the, the slides later on. Feel free to, to post it anywhere. Okay, great. This is really awesome. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, so that was, um, um, an, again, an inspiring talk from, um, from Andrew. Uh, we are now closing this session. Um, which has also been recorded and will be available as replay on, on the YouTube channel. We will post about this uh, after the conference. So thanks again, Andrew, um, and have uh, a good end of the, of the day. See you tomorrow for the web conference.